Hello, and thank you for joining NSBA for today's Small Business Congress. My name is Molly Day, and I'll be moderating the back end of this webinar. I'm happy now to turn it over to our CEO and President, Todd McCracken. Thank you very much, Molly. I appreciate everyone being here today. Again, I'm Todd McCracken. I'm the President and CEO of the National Small Business Association. Uh, and it's my great honor to, to begin and convene this uh, biannual Small Business Congress, where we begin to prioritize and, and set uh, our priorities for the coming Congress in the next couple of years. There's rarely been a more important time for the small business community, so I'm really happy to be here today. And I'm especially happy to introduce our 2021 uh, board chair, uh, M.L. Mackey. Um, uh, ML is the CEO and co-founder of Beacon Interactive Systems, a technology company in Waltham, Massachusetts that provides technology to the DOD to digitize operations, maintenance, and sustainment of military infrastructure. Uh, uh, ML is, is just a tremendous leader for the organization. She's been active in many business organizations from the Smaller Business Association in New England, uh, which is now the New England Business Association, uh, the National Defense Industrial Association, uh, and our own Small Business Technology Council. Um, ML is, is one of the reasons she's such a great leader for uh, NSBA as a bipartisan organization is she is so pragmatic and does see the uh, need to, to emphasize pragmatism and, and policy over partisanship. Um, and it's just, uh, I think it's the perfect person at the perfect time. Um, so with no further ado, I'll let ML take it out, take it over here and she will uh, sort of walk you through over what to expect for the next couple of hours and, uh, and uh, help lead the discussion. ML, thanks for being here. All right, thank you all for joining us today on, at NSBA for our culminating Small Business Congress. Over the past two weeks, we have held six outstanding sessions focusing on key areas of small business policy. Each of these sessions includes policy experts, small business leaders, and some engaging discussion on the biggest issues facing our businesses today. We'll be hearing from moderators of each of these sessions in just a bit, but before we launch, it, launch into that, I'd, we'd like to learn a bit more about you. So Molly has a, a, a quick poll for us. Oh, what an interesting group. So thanks for answering the poll today. It's, it's nice to learn a little bit more about who we all are and who's online. It's nice to know that individually and now collectively, we are NSBA. And as Todd mentioned, NSBA is a nonpartisan, issue-based advocacy organization, member-driven with 65,000 members in every state and industry. We encourage you to submit your questions today via the Q&A platform. Due to the high number of registrants, we have disabled the chat. Today is about coming together. It is about coming together to collaborate on ideas in order to inform legislators and policymakers on the realities of the small business experience. We need today to articulate what is useful and what is not in describing that experience and the legislative impacts on that experience. That is the only thing we are coming to discuss today. Treasure this time as I do. Value it as a collaborative discussion amongst your peers in order to bring a true small business voice forward. It is and has been my honor to serve NSBA, and it is a real pleasure to work with the board and the leadership council, particularly over these past two weeks as we've heard from some new voices and coalesced around some very important platforms for the organization. I'm very happy to share this time with you and the outstanding NSBA leadership you'll be hearing from shortly. And before we dig into all this, though, I'd like to share a video with you from John Stanford, co-executive director at the Small Business Roundtable. NSBA's biennial gathering is one of the most important convenings in the small business community. I feel so grateful to be able to join you, albeit virtually, with a few remarks today. Small Business Roundtable is focused on ensuring that small businesses have a clear voice in Washington across all the different groups that advocate for small businesses. With that in mind, it could not be more important that policymakers in Congress and the administration focus on small business issues, because as we turn from pandemic response to recovery, there will be no economic recovery, there will be no workforce recovery if small businesses are not leading the way. Whatever the issue is, I think it's gonna be critical that small business owners' voices are heard. And we often get asked what by small business owners, what can I do to make sure my voice is heard? Well, you've already taken the enormous first step. You're a participant in the National Small Business Association, a leading voice for small businesses in Washington. So congratulations on already making sure your voice is heard through the incredible team that you have representing you here in Washington. In addition, 
I think Congress and this administration are looking to hear small business owner stories. So anytime that NSBA or others are reaching out to hear your story of entrepreneurship, take time to share it. Take time to explain the challenges you had around capital. As much as policymakers are willing to hear from organizations in Washington about the state of the small business environment, they much more care to hear from someone in their district. They want to hear from someone who is living a life outside the beltway. And so I encourage you to pick up a pen and write a letter, to write an op-ed, to participate in a roundtable, and to get your voice heard in Washington. But like I said, you've already taken a great first step in participating in this Small Business Congress, in supporting the National Small Business Association and the great work they do. I'm so pleased to have had even a few moments of your time. I think policy is going to be a key focus for the entire small business community. The role of government in coming out of the coronavirus pandemic is going to be as large as we've felt it in many of our lives. And so I think it is incumbent upon all of us that we stay active and educated and participate in policymaking discussions. And we're so grateful for our longstanding partnership with NSBA. Enjoy the rest of your Congress. Wow, so great commentary. You know, it's interesting as I, as I listen to John speak about this, one of the things that viscerally I experienced when, we, when I first engaged with NSBA was how true his statements are about how members of Congress really do want to hear about our individual experiences. And more times than not, I found that things that were problematic for small business weren't necessarily because no one cared. It was because they really didn't understand the experience. So I'm going to emphasize again and share with you a little bit of my experience that when you meet with people locally in your area, there's a big impact. Meeting with them in DC is a big deal. Meeting locally with your members, being able to represent your experience. And then what was really helpful to me was being able to take these issue briefs that come out of the Small Business Congress and authoritatively say, and let me be a point of contact for you to others in other areas that you may have uh, interest in hearing from. And I have a way I can, one, I can leave you with this information. I can speak to the level of, of what we've talked about here at the Small Business Congress and what's in this briefing, but I also know how to reach in and get you the experts that can share in a primary source kind of way their, their experience with this as well. So, John, thank you for making me remember that that um, that, that pleasure of, of understanding that experience. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Small Business Congress happens every two years. It's how NSBA decides on our priority issues for the coming two years. Typically, we hold this in person, which many of you have heard um, over the last two weeks. As the extrovert that I am, I miss entirely. Nonetheless, Todd and the staff have done a fantastic job setting up these webinars, you know, six webinars over a two-week span leading up today. Um, I'll remind you that the priorities we developed today the priorities for the organization are more of a guiding star. It's, it's where we're heading, it's where we're focused, it's where we're all able to get together and move on, but they are not written in stone. We, we have the processes inside the organization to be nimble and responsive to new information, as well as new issues that arise. We have the ability to flex. So with that in mind, we need to set an agenda. And today, we will first hear from some lawmakers and the administration on the importance of small business. Next, we'll learn more about the unique role our NSBA Leadership Council plays. Thank you all for joining us today. And then we'll engage in a policy roundtable where the moderators from our preceding six sessions will briefly summarize the discussions in their sessions. These moderators are the current committee chairs for their designated areas or, or past chairs with a breadth of experience on the topic. Each of them is not only impressive in their knowledge of policy and NS NSBA, but all, also experienced, thoughtful leaders who have played a critical role in this process. And again, I will remind all of us are doing this as volunteers when we all have small businesses to run. It's, it's a fantastic group of people, very, very thoughtful leaders. Thank you for your contributions to this process. After the roundtable, we'll hear a little more from our congressional experts on what's likely ahead in the coming two years on Capitol Hill. I always find these conversations so fascinating. And then after that, we'll share how you can be more engaged with NSBA and the various opportunities this great organization has for its members. Throughout the session today, we'll be conducting a series of informal, informal polls to get a read on how all of us on the session are feeling about the discussion and the issues we're considering. And finally, perhaps most important, we will conclude the session and send you a link to the formal priority voting survey. The final voting will not occur during the webinar, 
it will be emailed to you after the session. Please remember to check your spam folder if this email hasn't arrived in your inbox by 3 p.m. today. Voting will only be open through the end of the day today. With that, I'm going to take the prerogative as the chair and, and recognize one of our outstanding leaders at, at NSBA. I want to speak a little bit to you about Mark Amato. Mark is the immediate past chair. He was the 2020 chair of NSBA. And I, as, as his vice chair, watching what he did last year, I just I can't explain enough to you that it was no small feat what he did to navigate the leadership of this organization through the significant and certainly unexpected economic impacts of COVID. A year when the small business community needed us more than ever, when the economic pressure on our membership threatened to place similar pressures on our organizational resources, and when our advocacy for small businesses was more crucial than it has ever been but we've come through it all so well. <laughs> One would say even with flying colors, 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 flying colors. <laughs> One might say that if they articulated words correctly. We've come through it with flying colors, thanks in no small part to Mark's steady hand at the helm. Like any good entrepreneur, he looked at the crisis and said, okay, how do we come out of this stronger, tempered by this experience? His leadership focused on driving both the board and the staff to creatively and aggressively diversify revenue sources, resulting in a sound and financially secure 2020 for NSBA. His attention to bringing in new leadership has also helped swell the ranks of a broad diversity of new small business champions for NSBA, and his unfailing consideration and solicitation of the views of all have kept this organization as a beacon of bipartisan hope that we can all come together for the greater good. Mark's work here at NSBA is not over. Seriously, Mark, it's not over. <laughs> we will continue to rely on, on Mark, but I wanted to take this very public occasion to say thank you. And with that, I turn it over to Mark. That was a really wonderful thing to say, and I, and I appreciate it. And um, you're right, it's, we do what all small businesses do. We see a problem, we come together, and we create a vision. And uh, creating a vision, it was amazing how many people stepped up to try to see it and understand it and work together to solve it. Uh, we executed on the vision. We worked really, really hard on all the committee seats. Everybody did their part, and uh, it ended up being a really successful year. And and that just has to just goes to show if you persevere and you're working at it, you can always get the job done. So it was it was great. I I think it was one of the most challenging things I've ever done in my volunteer world. Um, it taught me a lot. Uh, I was able to really see people come together no matter what to solve a problem, which was terribly exciting. And um, I think that we turn the organization over to you uh, in good shape and you are going to make it fabulous. So I'm very much looking forward to your leadership and yes, I'll, I'll be glad to help you in any way that I can as a past chair. <laughs> Thank you. So is this kind of like when people say, you know, the best day when you're a boat owner is when you buy the boat and when you sell the boat. Is this like the best time is when you become the chair and then when you're the past chair? I, I, we'll see. We'll see how this year goes. <laughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of small business. We all know the importance of small business. Not only is it important to us, our families, and our employees, it's certainly important to the communities and vitally important to the U.S. economy. Regardless of whatever challenges we face, pandemic, political upheaval, economic freefall, kind of a depressing list, one thing nearly everyone in this country agrees on is the important role that we as small business play in our economy. I am really happy to, to share with you that the two small business committees on Capitol Hill truly are champions of small business. The Senate and House both have a long tradition of bipartisan work. D does my heart well to see how well they work together, and can in these times specifically be a shining example to other committees. The members of these committees may not always agree, but they work hard to set aside partisan politics, what we should expect of all of our members of Congress. They get to the work we need them to do. And in my years as an advocate, few committees on the Hill work as well together as these committees do. Now it is my distinct pleasure to share with you a video from the House Small Business Committee Chair, Nidia Velasquez, and Ranking Member Blaine Lutkemeyer to talk to us a little bit about the importance of small business from that perspective. So Molly, over to you for the videos. Small businesses touch nearly every facet of our lives. Small firms, move our country forward. They are the workshops where entrepreneurs craft big ideas that change the nation. A 
Across the country, small businesses are at the forefront of clean energy and other forward-leaning industry that will make the country and the world a better place. These contributions are crucial to our national economy. Small firms make up over 99% of all businesses and employ nearly 50% of U.S. workers. They generate almost half of all U.S. economic activity and account for over 60% of new jobs created every year in the U.S. Obviously, all of you know how important small business is from the standpoint of the number of businesses uh, and the jobs that you create. Um, you know, roughly 70% of the jobs, new jobs in this country are created by small business. Uh, roughly 50% of total jobs are in small business. Uh, you are the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the people who drive this country's e economy, not only at the local level, but the national level. So um, you are extremely important. You're a vital part of this total economic picture. been a really comfortable place for us to work. We've always had an open door relationship with the chairs and the ranking members of the House and the Senate Small Business Committees. Uh, and I, I think it's safe to say that that's, uh, that's continuing now. And so we really want to thank uh, Chair Velasquez and ranking member uh, Luke Meyer um, for continuing that tradition. Uh, now I'd like to turn our attention a little bit to the administration. And we're really happy to have uh, 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 a really important guest with us today, uh, Bharat Rumamurthy, who's a dep deputy director of the National Economic Council, is going to talk to us a little bit about the economic plans of the uh, um, of the uh, administration. I think specifically some of the announcements that came out this week, but also I think uh, we'll ask him about a sort of a longer term view of where things are going economically and the unique role that small businesses uh, can play. Um, I'm really happy to have Bharat here today. He's he's really been uh, kind of a point person for small business for the administration. So he's a great person to have speaking with us today. Uh, he's been a Senate staffer for a number of years in many capacities, attorney by trade, uh, and importantly has served on the COVID-19 Congressional Oversight Commission uh, most recently. And uh, so he's, uh, he's doing a tremendous job at the administration at drinking from a fire hose, but I'm really pleased that he could take the time to be here today. So I'll turn it over to him. Bharat, thanks for being here. Uh, what's going on with the, the small business package. Uh, uh, thanks, Todd, and uh, thanks everyone uh, for having me on today. Um, and thank you for all the work that you you do uh, in your communities. Um, uh, you know, I want to touch on a couple of things. Number one, uh, as Todd mentioned, just an overview of um, of what we're trying to do on small business in the Biden Harris administration. And then number two, uh, talk a little bit about the specific changes that the president announced yesterday to the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, so number one, as, as the president has made clear, there are uh, serious problems and a lot of pain right now in the small business community, as we know. Um, the, the, the key to the president's response is, is the uh, American Rescue Plan that he's uh, working with Congress to get enacted right now. Uh, you know, that plan is intended to, to get uh, people vaccinated as quickly as possible, which we think is the number one key to um, getting the economy back on track. Uh, also get uh, money for schools to get schools reopened quickly and safely, uh, uh, a significant amount of relief to uh, families that really need it. Uh, and then lastly, and, and most relevant here, um, a significant amount of money for our communities, both state and local government and uh, for small businesses specifically. So uh, there is uh, $50 billion in additional relief uh, for small businesses. Uh, Congress uh, over the last uh, few weeks has added even a little bit more money, so it's now looking like uh, more like $60 billion all told. Uh, some of that is going through the EIDL uh, advance program that uh, some of you are probably familiar with. Uh, this, the president is also uh, putting $10 billion into a small business opportunity fund, which is intended uh, uh, not just for relief, but actually to, to sort of rebuild and grow coming out of the other side of the crisis. So that'd be uh, you know, working capital for small businesses to use. Um, and there's a significant amount of money for uh, specifically the restaurant industry, uh, $25 billion in grants uh, for that, uh, you know, for restaurants, bars, breweries, et cetera, some of the companies that have been uh, hardest hit uh, by the crisis. Um, you know, it's critically important that we uh, get that uh, passed uh, as soon as possible, uh, get that money out into the community, get the money we need to distribute vaccines more quickly. Uh, and that's the top priority of the president. 
Uh, on top of that, at the same time, we are uh, administering uh, the PPP, the latest round of the PPP, which uh, came online, uh, as you all know, shortly before uh, the president's inauguration. Uh, we, we hit about the one month mark uh, uh, earlier this week, and, um, and the data is good. You know, the, the amount of lending going to, to businesses with fewer than 10 employees is up 60% compared to the last round. The, the percentage of funding going to rural communities is up 30%. Uh, so there's some good data there, but the president uh, wants to do more to make sure that the money is going to, uh, you know, small small mom and pop business um, and to businesses that might have been cut out of previous rounds of relief. So what he announced yesterday was uh, a set of changes, uh, the the most prominent of which is um, starting tomorrow a two week exclusivity period uh, during which only businesses with fewer than 20 employees can apply for PPP. Uh, and the idea there is that, um, you know, we know that uh, it takes sometimes takes a little bit extra time and work with lenders to get these smaller companies through the process. Um, some of these smaller companies don't have an accountant or a lawyer or other resources available to them to navigate the PPP process. And, and also that lenders sometimes may be, you know, more focused on serving bigger clients and don't have the time. Uh, or the or the resources to dedicate to surfing smaller clients are going out into their communities and finding smaller businesses uh, to work with. So the goal of the, of the two week period is really to um, uh, force lenders to really focus on on the smallest businesses in their community and for for us in the administration to back that up uh, with a concerted outreach effort to try and spread the word about this opportunity and, and to make sure that businesses know what relief is available to them. Uh, there was a, there were several other changes that the president announced. Uh, there was a, a reform to the way that uh, sole proprietors can access the program and can receive and calculate the amount of money that they're entitled to under the program. Uh, there was a change to um, how student loan uh, delinquency affects eligibility. Um, at the moment, uh, as before yesterday, uh, if you were uh, delinquent on your student federal student loans, uh, which millions of people are. Um, you're ineligible for PPP. Uh, we're changing that so that uh, business owners who may be behind on their student loan payments can still get support. Uh, and we're adopting a bipartisan proposal that gets rid of a, a, a restriction that says that if you've been uh, convicted uh, of a felony, uh, a non-fraud related felony, uh, you are um, you're barred from participating in the program. And we're also clarifying that uh, all lawful US residents are, are eligible to participate in the program and that includes people who file their taxes using uh, ITIN numbers, like visa, uh, visa applicants, green card holders, and so on. Um, these are uh, reforms intended to help the smallest companies and to promote access uh, and equity uh, throughout the program. Um, so we really hope that, that you will uh, take advantage of the program if you haven't already, that you will um, tell your, your networks about these opportunities, that you will talk to people in your communities about this. We, really would love to see over the next two weeks in particular, a push to get more applications in the door, especially for those, those smaller companies. Um, and we stand ready to, to work with you all uh, and, and lenders uh, to make that happen. So uh, thanks for having us uh, today. Thanks again for, um, uh, for all the work that you do. Thank you for joining us today. It's really great to have you here. Um, before you leave, I'd like to just emphasize a couple of things that I heard from you that I want you to know how much are appreciated by the small business community. All of the things that you said are appreciated. The speed, the purposefulness to the smallest of the small businesses is so critical. You know, you have this wide description of small business, there's programs set in place, and larger businesses have mechanisms to effectively go after it. And the smalls that are just really, it's just fantastic. The second thing that I'd like to emphasize is this purposefulness to a $10 billion opportunity fund, one of the things that doesn't get measured in the small business persistence that Mark Romano talked to earlier in his leadership and is so endemic to all of us is the opportunity costs of these times. And we maintain, but how do you also then set the pipeline ahead? So kudos to your team, I appreciate that thoughtfulness. And the last thing I'd like to say before you head out, is we are so looking forward to working with you. And I will tell you that I am consistently impressed with the people on the board that have real world visceral understanding of how to most efficiently get access to capital quickly and effectively to small businesses. So anything we can do to support you in this process, please don't hesitate to call on us. Uh, great, I, I thank you for that. I just wanna say one more thing because I saw somebody in the chat asked um, 
how can we how can we let people know about all of this? Um, SBA.gov. It's a brand we've we've updated the website. Uh, it's more user friendly now. With a single click, you can find uh, lenders in your area. You can find community resources to help you fill out an application and all of that. Um, uh, if you can direct folks there, hopefully that that'll be a good place for them to find uh, uh, the steps that they need to take in order to get relief. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate the work. Keep going. Godspeed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll talk soon. All right. So next, um, for those of you who have joined us over the last two weeks, and we've had six different sessions, so multiple different conversations, some of you may already have had the pleasure of meeting Tamika Montgomery. For those of you who have not, Tamika runs Core Strategy Partners in Maryland, an economic development insights and strategy consulting firm. I want to tell you a little bit about the interesting path of Tamika and her engagement with NSBA. She was first on the NSBA board as part of one of our affiliate organizations, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. Then she was a presidential appointee at the SBA during the Obama administration, leading the Office of Entrepreneurial Development. Then she came back to NSBA on the Leadership Council and is now again back on the board. Tamika has joined us for every session, so I'm really interested to hear from her any perspective or insights she may have for us as we kick off this final issue session. Over to you, Tamika. Thank you, ML. Thanks, everyone. Um, happy to be here again um, as we uh, wrap up our Small Business Congress and really looking forward to seeing the results of what we vote on together. Um, as ML mentioned, you know, my pathway to the Board of Trustees has been through a number of different ways with NSBA, but more recently, and what I want to talk to you all about today is about the Leadership Council and the importance of the leadership Council. Um, some of you, hopefully on the call, uh, many of you I'm sure on the call are part of the Leadership Council, but those of you who are not, the, the Leadership Council provides a unique opportunity for small business leaders like ourselves to be a critical link between national policy and locally elected officials. And so the, the Leadership Council's pathway to an even greater and deeper involvement into NSBA and the 30 member board of trustees is really how I became engaged. Um, I had the opportunity through, through my involvement with the leadership council, it really encouraged me to reach out to locally elected officials and really communicate to them the challenges that business owners were having because of the COVID, because of COVID and the pandemic. And um, offer, I was able to offer some recommendations on a local level, what some strategies might be to help alleviate um, some and provide relief to small businesses. And so I encourage you to get involved because you it, that link is so important and to hear the voice of the small business owner is so important um, in shaping policies. And so this opportunity, the Leadership Council provides a very unique and exclusive opportunity for us to be engaged and to help shape NSBA policy and ultimately national policy as it relates to small businesses. So I'm excited about today's discussion and I look forward to just listening in and being a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Tamika. I appreciate, appreciate your comments and your thoughtfulness to what we're doing today. Alrighty, so at this point, I'm going to introduce you our, to our policy roundtable. Um, we have our fearless policy leaders who have been working hard in the past weeks to help us craft and moderate robust discussions on a diverse range of topics. The six people who are joining us now, come on in and join us, have impressive background in their specific policy area and have been very active with NSBA for decades. Beyond their smarts, there are a lot of smarts. They're just really good people. I so enjoy working with the team that we have here at NSBA. They're collaborative leaders, they genuinely seek input from people on their committees, and they are pragmatic in ensuring that the discussions we're having are focused, open, and productive. Really. Like any good small business owner, how do we get something done instead of just talk about it kind of thing. They all have their own political positions, but to be honest, I couldn't tell you what most of them are. These people embody what makes NSBA so special. They prioritize policy over politics and come to the table with solutions and ideas to help small businesses start, run, and prosper. 
The folks who ran our previous discussions on the six areas we are going to vote on today are Marilyn Wilson-Lund, Managing Partner of Wave Group, a strategic consulting firm in real estate based in California. Marilyn is the reading, leading researcher in the real estate industry today and brings keen communications, positioning, and marketing skills to Wave Group and MSBA. Marilyn is the current NSBA Chair for Economic Development and has highlighted during the discussion a lot of our technology and trade issues. Next is Malcolm Prouty, the President and CEO of Systems Material Research Corporation, a small business specializing in R&D for the aerospace and defense sectors. Malcolm, we are particularly happy to have you joining us from Austin and all of our Texas members. We're happy to have you here with us given the very difficult situation so many people are facing in Texas right now. Malcolm is NSBA's Chair for tax Taxation and he'll walk us through our, what was our very first session two weeks ago. Bob Shea is a partner at Beck Reed Ryden in Boston, where he specializes in labor and, and employment law. Bob, Bob is our chair for health and human resources and has been a recurring expert on various webinars and podcasts for NSBA as we've all had to navigate the new landscape of work in the pandemic. Pandemic, Bob, you have a true volunteer ethic and you give in a very generous manner. Thank you. Bob will outline the labor and employment session for us. Marilyn Landis is the president and CEO of Basic Business Concepts, a Pittsburgh-based business that provides CFO-level advice to small businesses, critical all the time, critical in crisis even more. Marilyn is our resident expert on all things finance and has joined us for several webinars and podcasts on the PPP. Marilyn is a past chair for NSBA and will talk to us today about capital access and in, during the economic development session. Gary Kushner is a chair and is the chair and president of Kushner and Company, a leading HR and benefits company based in Portage, Michigan. Gary was the Michigan chair for the 1995 White House Conference on Small Business, he is a past chair of NSBA, and is a well known expert on healthcare policy. Gary, as you guessed, will walk us through the healthcare session discussion. Bill Belknap is CEO and President of AEONRG LLC, a Pennsylvania-based business providing maintenance, repair, and operations services to support the Veterans Affairs and various other federal and state governments. Bill is a West Point graduate who served 20 years in the Army. Thank you for your service. And currently serves as NSBA's... <laughs> that was a little bit of my Boston. I had an idea coming out there about NSBA, NSBA's chair <laughs> for Environment and Regulatory Affairs. Bill will give us a snapshot of the regulatory policy session. Marilyn, unfortunately, is unable to be with us today, so I'm gonna turn over the trade and tech discussion to you, Todd. Thank you very much, ML, and I, we really are sorry that uh, uh, Marilyn Wilson can't be with us today. As you know, as small business owners out there, it's, you know, sometimes business just happens and, and you've, you've got to deal with it. So uh, I'll try to do my best. I'm not sure I'm a good fill-in for Marilyn and her expertise, but I will, uh, I will see if I can sort of outline for you the, the, the key issues that uh, came out of that session. There are three that were discussed uh, at some depth and, and, and rose to the top in the priority list. Uh, for the leadership council members who are on that discussion. The first is cybersecurity and financial protection. Uh, it's, we did some online surveying in that session and found out that uh, you know, cybersecurity remains a, a significant problem for small companies and there's many facets. Uh, but there's also a significant amount of concern about uh, the protection of, of, of uh, uh, small business uh, banking uh, accounts uh, and, and being able to extend some protections to them in a way that uh, consumers currently have, individuals currently have some protections uh, against uh, uh, cyber threats. Um, but also, the, many small companies need more tools. They need they need help uh, figuring out the cyber security threats, uh, and they also need help in you know maintaining their businesses in the face of ever elevating standards for cybersecurity. Many small companies. Uh, uh, now have to meet fairly high standards for cybersecurity systems in place and procedures in place in order to gain federal contracts, to gain contracts with uh, with larger private companies as well. Uh, and it's becoming a, a significant potential barrier to, uh, to, to business for those companies. The second issue is, is uh, strengthening federal innovation programs for small business. The focus there really was the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovative Research Program, uh, has been just a beacon of of innovation and and 
and partnership between the federal government and the small business community uh, for, for decades now. And NSBA has always been a leading supporter of this program, and there's a unique opportunity now to really strengthen the program and make it permanent. That program, the authorization for it expires in 2022, uh, and we think there's a significant opportunity to make that permanent and to, uh, and to expand and improve it. Uh, for the long term and for the long term health of our of our of our economy, it's the one piece that dedicates uh, a, a piece of the federal entrepreneurial excuse me uh, uh, a research budget uh, to the small business community, uh, and we've always been strongly supportive. And then finally, uh, data privacy. Uh, many people have heard about uh, the various rules that govern uh, websites in Europe initially, and now in many states, uh, but there are emerging data privacy regulations that, that go beyond mere websites, but certainly can and encapsulate uh, any visitors that you have, any data that you collect from, uh, from a website visitor, but also other data that small companies and others are, are collecting. Um, and it's a real landmine for the small business community because every single state potentially is developing its own rules. And, and of course, the reason folks focus on websites is because they cross state lines, obviously, and cross international boundaries as well. So there's a significant issue there. We need, we need a national federal standard uh, that is reasonable and workable for the small business community uh, so that they can uh, deal with those issues. And so that was, those were the main topics that came up in that session. Uh, I think maybe we'll talk a little bit more about some of those things as, as we do a dialogue overall. But I think that's a summation of the things that rose to the top and the, and the tenor of the discussion. Uh, we talked about those last week, you know. So thank you. It's a great summary. Thanks so much. And for those of you that are interested, there was a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing this morning about uh, emerging technology. And not only was SBIR supported, interestingly enough, it was supported by the former head of Google and, and the former head of Microsoft, specifically in terms of small business and how important keeping us engaged in the federal innovation ecosystem is. So just good stuff to watch. It's interesting to understand how all our partners across the industrial base involve the, understand the impact of small business on the economy. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to Malcolm. He's gonna to talk to us about taxes. And Malcolm, as always, I am so glad that your facile brain, your attention to detail is driving and leading this effort for us. So over to you. Thanks, Amel. Thanks for the earlier introduction. It uh, feels like our session on tax policy discussion was so long ago, uh, especially with the crazy polar vortex that swept through our area and uh, surrounding states that literally hampered the ability for many of our small businesses to operate. I hope everyone affected by the weather uh, stayed safe and has been able to get their businesses back up and running. I've got to say, it's great to see the spring-like conditions back up a window again. Uh, during um, our tax policy session a couple weeks ago, we had a robust discussion with Brian Reardon of Reardon Consulting and Garrett Watson of Tax Foundation around several issues, uh, including the proposed tax uh, plan uh, presented by the Biden administration and what that might mean for small business, uh, tax related issues around COVID relief leg legislation, and also ways that we can help shape uh, tax policy uh, post COVID uh, to help spur economic development for the small uh, business community. Uh, as with all of these sessions, uh, following our tax policy session, we polled our attendees uh, to see what the top priorities they felt NSBA should be working on over the next two years. Uh, one of these uh, top issues from the polling was eliminating the self-employment tax on healthcare. Uh, as you may know, uh, self-employed individuals, unlike large corporations, uh, cannot fully deduct the cost of their health insurance as a business expense. Uh, the NSBA won the first battle uh, along these lines in 2003, uh, allowing self-employed individuals to deduct the cost of health insurance for income tax purposes. Uh, however, they are still not on par with uh, larger businesses, and there is uh, much more to be done uh, in this arena. Uh, another issue that rose to the top of polling was enacting tax reform that prioritizes uh, simplification. Uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act enacted by the Trump administration in late 2017 uh, has been in effect for, for a few years now, uh, but key portions of it are only temporary, uh, specifically those that help the majority of small businesses, uh, especially the pass-through uh, entities. Uh, the TCGA, uh, 
was great in that it lowered rates on individuals and businesses and updated the business tax code to jumpstart America's global competitiveness. Uh, however, it did fail to include uh, tax simplification, uh, parity between large and small businesses, uh, permanency of change, and uh, deficit reduction. Uh, also, uh, in 2025, uh, most individual and pasture cuts and some business tax cuts will revert to pre-reform levels. Uh, so there's a, a lot to, a work to do in, in tax reform uh, to fight for small business and, and uh, getting uh, our tax treatment on par with uh, how large businesses are treated. Uh, and then yet another issue identified uh, as important to our attendees uh, was seeking deficit reduction and entitlement reform. Uh, despite some short-term improvements made in recent years, long-term debt challenges remain and in coming decades, the debt will squeeze budgetary resources that are vital to our economic success and competitiveness will be stymied. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the legislation enacted in response created an additional set of issues uh, which obviously need to be considered. So a lot of uh, really great issues uh, rose to the top of uh, what our attendees felt important. Um, more details on these issues and others can be found in the Small Business Congress booklet sent out ahead of this meeting. And uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Mel. I am profoundly happy to hear that there is spring outside your window. You've been in my thoughts, mm -hmm. you and your family. You know, Malcolm, we actually have a, a, a quick poll, if you want to ask it, of the, uh, of the tax burden for folks. Um, and this is, this is Todd doing a good thing. I, I missed the cyber one, too. We need to do both of them. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Todd, for catching that and keeping us on track. <laughs> So uh, Molly just uh, put up a poll for everybody uh, who, who can access this, uh, asking uh, which of the following poses the largest burden on your business when it comes to federal taxes? Is it complexity, financial cost, or administrative cost? And uh, we'll leave this up for, uh, for a few seconds to, to let everybody answer and uh, see what everybody's response is. Great, it looks like uh, there was a, a good uh, spread across all three uh, with uh, complexity rising to the top with 45% uh, of attendees voting for that. Uh, definitely uh, a huge burden on, uh, on small business, uh, but financial costs wasn't very far behind uh, and uh, as, as well as administrative costs. So I think, uh, I think uh, most small businesses agree, all three are, uh, are quite burdensome uh, in, in one way or another. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah, and you could argue that the complexity is what adds to that financial cost and the administrative cost. So, absolutely. All good. So, do we want to do the cybersecurity question, or do we want to just move on to the next issue, Todd? What do you think? Let's just move on for now. All right, excellent. I'll try to I'll try to pay closer attention. <laughs> All right, so we just talked through taxation. Now we're going to bring Bob Shea on to talk about labor and employment. If, if over to you, Bob. All right. Thank you. Uh, so we also had a very robust discussion uh, in our session, uh, and we recognize there's a lot on the table in the labor and employment law area, uh, legislatively as well as uh, administratively. There's already immediate changes at the Department of Labor, which includes OSHA, and we're going to see changes at NLRB and, uh, and EOC as well. The three uh, issues that rose to the top in uh, our polling uh, starts off with uh, the minimum wage. And I think folks have been hearing a lot about the minimum wage. The uh, Raise the Wage Act of 2021 would raise the minimum wage uh, from 7.25, its current uh, rate, to $15 per hour over four years. And um, the minimum wage is, as I said, 7.25 right now has been that uh, at that level for 12 years. I think a majority of Americans view it as uh, too low. Uh, but raising it by more than half, by more than double uh, over four years, particularly at this time when small businesses are still struggling uh, to overcome the, uh, the problems raised by the pandemic and struggling to keep their doors open and, and maintain their payroll is, is too much for a lot of our members. Uh, and it's not just the minimum wage. When a minimum wage goes up, typically there's upward pressure on wages, you know, uh, for many levels uh, above that. 
Uh, the Congressional Business of uh, Budget Office has estimated that raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour will put about 1.3 million more employees out of work. Uh, we believe that lawmakers should uh, uh, oppose the, uh, the Raise the Wage Act, that uh, policymakers should exercise great caution in taking any action that will impose significant increased costs on small businesses while they continue to struggle with the consequences uh, of the pandemic. The uh, next issue that rose uh, near the top was uh, an old one, <laughs> a familiar one, improving workforce uh, training. Uh, our nation continues to have high unemployment. I believe the rate is about twice what it was pre-pandemic still. Yet at the same time, uh, many employers are reporting that they are unable to fill open positions with qualified applicants. Uh, NSBA's Small Business Workforce and Labor Survey shows that many members believe that the quality of high school level workers has declined during the past five years. And the need for improved workforce training continues to be a top issue for small businesses. Uh, we believe that policymakers uh, must work to address the needs of small businesses for skilled workers and support workforce training efforts. Uh, third and last issue uh, that rose to the top, we have many issues that were, were discussed and many issues we'll be dealing with, but the third issue is the issue of employer-provided paid leave for employees. And uh, paid leave has gained traction in recent years, and uh, the concept of mandated paid leave has received a, received a boost during the pandemic uh, as a result of the family's uh, first corona virus uh, relief act which provided for a paid leave uh, through the end of the year and provided tax credits for employees to continue paid leave beyond that uh, even as the pandemic recedes the biden administration is advocating for broader paid leave benefits for employees and while we recognize the societal benefits of paid leave for employees we do not believe the federal government should be imposing the burden and cost providing these benefits on small business. And um, NSBA surveys show that over 80% of our members already offer forms of paid leave that support workers, uh, but work within their own financial and operational needs. Uh, government mandates requiring small businesses to provide paid leave impede, can impede job creation uh, when we need it most, and we create, create and, and inevitably creates complex new regulations for small businesses to uh, to navigate. So, again, while there are societal values for sure for paid leave for a family and 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 sick leave purposes, uh, you know we uh, advocate for great caution imposing the cost of those leaves on the small business community. And those are our three issues. And I think there's a polling question uh, in this section as well. Yeah, they got a minimum wage question. All right. Please select which of the following is the biggest issue when it comes to raising the minimum wage. Well, people are filling this out. I, I really, this improved workforce training. You know, you said here it comes again. It's an oldie, but again, right? Like the best, as a small business owner, the best access to capital for me is, is revenue, right? The best way to take care of your family, provide for your home is the ability to get a good job versus look for handouts. Like this whole improved workforce training is just across the board, a brilliant and an ongoing focus for our economy, I think. Mel, could I say one thing about workforce training really quick while you're waiting? Please do. Yeah, so um, I just sent a, I just sent a note out to everybody so they can see it. But um, every state has a, a workforce investment board, and the work the role of workforce investment board is to uh, channel funding from the federally funded WIOA programs down into the state, usually through a governor's workforce board. This training is designed specifically for new worker training, incumbent worker training. Um, developmental uh, special skills within an organization and of course soft skills there's a lot of uh, a lot of needs for soft skills training but if you find an employee and you go to uh, the investment board groups and whoever's managing the funding they can actually get you up to 50 cents on the dollar for up to six months for incumbent worker training so there is dollars for that you can do the training or you can actually outsource the training to others so 
take a minute and check it out if you're looking for people. It's really a good thing to do. Thank you. It's a great, great public service announcement. I think small business owners, we get used to, we got to build, we got to do it all. Like looking for those kind of resources is really valuable. Thank you, Mark. So Molly, I think we have some results back in. Yeah, I'll comment on them if it's okay. Uh, it, it's interesting. The 36% uh, identified the biggest issue as direct cost, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, uh, 30, uh, excuse me, 28%, uh, 38 respondents identified regional disparities uh, in cost of living, which is a significant point. When you raise the $15, the minimum wage of $15 an hour, it's, it translates differently in New York City and San Francisco versus uh, other parts, including rural parts of the country. And a uh, significant portion, about one quarter of the respondents, so see no issue and support the increasing the minimum wage. And uh, I think a large part of the population would support the minimum wage beyond 725. It's, uh, the issues come with, uh, at this juncture, well, we're still dealing with the pandemic and the, the, the size of the increases that have been, uh, are being advocated now, uh, which has no uh, difference depending upon what region of the country uh, the business is operating in. So, Bob, as always, thoughtful and purposeful commentary. Appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn Landis for Capital Access and Economic Development. Marilyn, over to you. Thanks, ML. I appreciate it. Uh, like all the other issue committees, our group met within the context of this roller coaster of an economy we are on right now. And given that context, access to capital and economic development have a whole different uh, parameters around them than our typical discussions. You know, as we were convening, we were, we, we were trying to look at our uh, way forward as survivors, all right? What are the barriers and the obstacles and the resources to secure the capital we need to fund our growth? In this roller coaster, let's identify what we need to do, who we can talk to, who can help us, and who we can help. So the access to capital and economic development sessions explored, and I'm gonna hit a number of issues, because it's important to understand the scope of the conversation before you think that our top three was too narrow. Let's talk a bit about the scope. Before I do a public service announcement just on collaboration, uh, earlier we heard from the administration about the recent changes. There's a couple of real game changers in the words he put forward. One, some of you asked about the link to SBA, it's sba.gov. If you're looking for a new lender in this two week period where you can, as an employer with less than 20 employees, find somebody who's open to you, SBA has on its website what's called Lender Match. And you put in your information and it will find a lender to match your perspective and what you're looking for. So if your bank isn't active during this two weeks, you can find one who is. Second, this is a huge game changer. He referenced the fact that there's a change to sole proprietors when they're filing what's called a Schedule C. Prior to this, you could only use the bottom line of your Schedule C, I line 31, that was your net profit. If you had no net profit, you had no potential to get a payroll protection loan. What changes, you can now use line seven. What that means is your gross, your sales, minus cost of sales, that gross profit number. Many small businesses don't have any cost of sales. So this is a game changer for them. They will be able to use that as a multiple instead of their net profit. So that's a big change for small businesses. One of the things is that we talked a lot about in our issue committee was funding to support needed to support all small business functions, SBA functions. Lending is a critical one, but they are often anything that Congress passes, we're gonna give it to SBA to do. We have to make sure SBA has the resources to do that. Right now, obviously, has, SBA has been in a very bright spotlight, which also shows its pluses and its minuses. So there's a push to advocate for improving it. I also a push, we discuss a lot about more flexibility in regulations to permit lenders, traditional lenders, banks, credit unions, to meet the capital needs of the small businesses that they would like to serve. We also talked about the SBA Treasury's oversight of payroll protection, IDLE, and its traditional 7A lending programs, and that there's a need, and some of this has been addressed already in the comments coming from both the House, the Senate, and the White House, 
need flexibility in the delivery and the procedures to simply um, increase access, especially to the smallest businesses, rural and underserved markets. So they heard us speaking at our ISTE session, they've already taken some action. We also talked about post COVID, what the lenders credit rules might look like uh, that could push, if they're more restrictive, that could push more small businesses to consider equity as in raising capital by selling pieces of their company, which involves the Securities and Exchange Commission. So we talked a bit about the SEC. Should it issue rules in line, should it issue rules in line with the law for crowdfunding, i.e. expanding it more, make it easier to use, and seek simplification and clarification that the SEC rules that small businesses want to seek equity if they're unable to find lending. We also talked about small business contracting. Uh, Small business has always looked for improved access to government contracting, now more important than ever because small businesses' resources themselves are limited, their access to capital is limited, and they don't have the resources to try to go after some of the bigger contracts. So there's a need to reduce or eliminate many of the current practices, uh, thereby improving the fairness for small business to be able to participate in the government programs. We also talked about the fact that small business depends on modern infrastructure, to operate and to grow. We often don't think of that as a small business issue, but most of us couldn't build our own bridge if we needed to get to it. Uh, so investments that would improve our failing infrastructure also would give small businesses a role in securing the work if we can get the subcontracting rules. So that was the general discussion, the speakers, the, the subject matter experts we had to frame that context. How do we do the best we can? What should we focus our efforts? coming, uh, uh, well, we're not off this roller coaster ride. That's the problem, all right? We're still not sure where the next dip is going to be. But what we did the polling as all the other issue groups did, and the consensus was to focus on three top issues. The first was on SBA lending. Why? Because the biggest need for small business is immediate funding. They need it now. So that was a key priority. Second was to improve access to capital because we need funding, will be the need for funding will be ongoing. It's not gonna go away anytime soon. Businesses who have survived, who pivoted, who are reinventing themselves, will need funding to move forward, take advantage of government contracting, they need funding. But it must be, the improved access to capital must be diverse. Banks, credit unions, equity raises, because there will be multiple different demands on the capital system, and we will be accessing it at different points with different needs. The third priority was supporting a robust small business contracting program. Why? Because it helps the economy recover, A, and two, it provides work for small businesses and their employees and their supply chains. So the top three that come out of our group were support SBA lending, we have an immediate need for funding, improve the access to capital because we have an ongoing need and we need it to be more diverse and more accessible. And lastly, to support small business contracting, it's only good for the economy, it's good for small business. So that's what we covered, we covered a lot of ground in our issue committee, had some great subject matter experts. And Molly, I think you have a poll for us. Marilyn, while people are filling out the uh, poll here, I'll take a moment to pull the thread of your roller coaster comments. I'm gonna go back to my Pittsburgh roots and Kennywood Park and hear that clack, clack, clack <laughs> of the roller coaster. And I so often say being a small business owner is kind of like the people who enjoy a roller coaster. It's exhilarating, it's exciting, and every once in a while it's just a little bit throwy. <laughs> well, it's that moment, Elmer, you're right, as you're coming to the top and you know you're gonna drop. Yeah. You know you're gonna drop and you've just gotta hang on. And many of us are doing the same thing we did in the roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and hanging on. You gotta embrace it. You gotta go in full hard. I love the work that you're doing here. And, and this is such an important area for the, not only for NSBA, but just for all small business. And I just really think we're having a good voice with this. Marilyn, thank you as always for supporting this area. Good, thank you. And we're getting, the thing is, with the focus that it's been on payroll protection, people are listening. The folks around NSBA have heard me say this since the very beginning though. There are those who will say, look, we gave small business a lot of money. What'd they do with it? Kept everyone what did they employed. do with it? Kept All right. everyone employed. <laughs> well, it goes back to the very beginning of this conversation when we said, tell your stories. Yeah. You yeah. have to be telling your stories because your congressmen, your senators need to know what your story is, how you use the funds, how you use the resources to survive. 
And it looks like uh, the lead on this poll is SBA lending, which fits everything we have seen because that's absolutely critical. Uh, that's how many businesses have survived through this point, payroll protection and idle. Also the earnings of the business, and that's usually traditionally a very high player. Unfortunately, many businesses are seeing those earnings squeezed almost to nothing. But that's one that hopefully we can get back to relying on again. Credit cards, yeah, that's a given fallback. When all else fails, the credit card companies tend to be more generous whether we need it or not. Um, interesting mix. I think you will find, just from my experience, we're going to see more people exploring other types of financing, looking at vendor credit, looking at private loans, looking at investing than we have seen before, simply because the banking industry also has to recover from a, a real blow to the economy and the ability for their borrowers to pay them. And it'll be a fascinating path forward with the innovation of small business participating in that. As always, Marilyn, thank you so much for your commentary and your sure. thoughtful leadership. So now we're going to turn it over to Gary Kushner to talk about healthcare. And Gary, so pleased to have you with us. So pleased that you're bringing your experience in this area and looking forward to what you have to say. Thanks so much, ML. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to report out on our uh, session earlier. We had a lot of great discussion, uh, wonderful small business input. Uh, it, it, it's kind of funny to me. Uh, maybe not funny, haha, -ha, but I still recall about 35 years ago in my career when I was working in an organization and my CEO came to me to complain about the high cost of healthcare because family coverage in the early 1980s was approaching $3,000 per year. And uh, this was going to be a huge strain on, on uh, employers. Um, for some small employers, $3,000 a month for family coverage might be, in some parts of the country, uh, considered acceptable today. Um, small business is hammered uh, both on the ability to offer health care to its employees um, uh, from a cost standpoint, because historically, we've not had the ability to uh, band together to offer the uh, negotiating club that large employers typically have. And so I always refer to us as being at the bottom of the waterfall and paying the highest cost, almost 40% higher than a comparable plan for a large employer. Um, and we see that reflected in the data. Uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation's 2020 Employer Health Survey showed that while 99% of large firms offer health benefits to some or all of their employees, only 55% of small employers do. And as the size of the small employer drops, employers of uh, three to nine employees, only 48% of them offer health benefits to their employees. And that becomes uh, a human resource uh, issue in the ability to recruit and retain competitive talent uh, across, the, across the board. Um, we've seen costs rise dramatically. My example earlier, but just in the last 10 years, costs uh, for average family premiums have risen from 13,250 in 2010, the year of the adoption of the ACA, to $20,438 per year in uh, 2020. And yet, when it comes to these costs, uh, more small employers cover the full cost of their employees, 27%, compared to their larger competitors that only cover roughly, uh, only 4% of them cover the full cost of, of coverage uh, for the employee. And so a lot of our discussion and focus in our group was dealing with how do we get health reform to begin to rein in the costs, particularly as it impacts small employers? And we had a number of issues uh, that we were able to identify. Number one, much greater transparency. Uh, when you or I go to a doctor's office or in, check into a hospital, uh, we don't see, you know, like at uh, the fast food establishment, a price tag next to the procedures we're about to to receive. Um, and so we are not able to truly be 
uh, a consumer of healthcare. We don't typically get quality data to be able to make an informed choice. And you and I, whenever we buy any product for ourselves or our families, you typically have both quality and cost data. Healthcare is the one part of our economy, 18% of our GDP currently, where we don't have any of that data. Um, there, is, there are two tax-related issues that uh, inhibit small employers from being able to offer health coverage. One is that non-C-Corp owners of, uh, uh, of small businesses, so sole proprietors, partners in a partnership, uh, sub-S uh, corporation owners, are not able to fully deduct the full cost of offering health care. Uh, for themselves uh, as the business owner, family members, and, and, and to their it serves as an inhibitor in offering to employees. And that's because um, payroll taxes are paid only by those self-employed individuals. Um, C-Corp owners don't have that. Employees in, in companies don't have that. It's only target the, the current uh, tax code. Uh, only targets that 15.3% tax to small employers, uh, non-C small employers. Part of the 2010 uh, Obamacare, the uh, Affordable Care Act, created a what looked like at the time perhaps a nice way to begin to control costs, but has actually worked against that uh, goal by saying that you can only charge a multiple of three times uh, the rate that you would charge to a, an older employee than you would charge to a 21-year-old employee, so a three-to-one age ban. And what we thought that was going to do back in 2010 was bring down the cost of health care for older employees who are typically, uh, I'm broadly overgeneralizing, less well and, and uh, consume greater health care costs. Um, what it did instead was raise the floor on younger employees. We believe that uh, one of the modifications, one of many modifications to the ACA ought to be uh, a re-examination of that three to one ratio and making it a five to one ratio to bring down the costs to encourage younger individuals to be in the health, uh, health plans which drives down overall costs. Um, the second tax-related issue deals with these arbitrary limitations on both health savings accounts and the ability of, again, non-C-Corp owners, small business owners, to be able to participate in their own company's flexible spending accounts. For some odd reason, only known to the IRS, um, the current laws prohibit a non-C-Corp small business owner from participating in his or her own uh, health and welfare plans, flexible benefit plans. So I might choose to offer to my employees a variety of different health and health-related benefit plans, but I'm not allowed to participate because the current IRS interpretation is that I am not an employee. I only work 80 hours a week or so here, but I'm not considered an employee. And so we are looking for legislative fixes uh, in that area as well, both the uh, ability of the self-employed to fully deduct healthcare costs and to be able to participate in their own company's plans. So with that, um, those our, our top issue really is under the one umbrella of reining in the cost of healthcare prioritized by transparency in healthcare cost and quality, consumer involvement, once we all uh, have the ability to look at and truly become a healthcare consumer, I would argue we've never been held. We consume healthcare, we're not consumers. Um, fixing the, the two tax issues, uh, the self-employment tax on healthcare, and enabling non-C-Corp small business owners the ability to participate as employees 
uh, in their own health and welfare benefits and cafeteria plans. So with that, uh, I know we have one more poll for everyone to participate in. So while we're waiting for that poll to come in, Gary, that, um, that visual of like, and we're at the bottom of the waterfall, like I totally want that to be a happy vacation place, but I more feel like pounded on the head with water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a visceral sensation when you describe that. <laughs> and thank you again for all the detail that you are so right on top of and able to bring to our team to be able to be informed on all this. My pleasure, ML. I, I have to say, NSBA has been uh, maybe the roller coaster analogy. And by the way, I grew up in Pittsburgh, so I knew Kennywood. Um, but the roller coaster analogy, we've had successes in. Uh, crafting parts of the uh, ACA, the ability of uh, small employers to offer what's now a simple cafeteria plan. We helped draft that language uh, that got incorporated. Uh, but also we've had our downsides where lots of our issues uh, either don't get addressed or don't get addressed in a way that we would like to see. Yeah. So let's take a look at this survey. Uh, yeah, not a surprise to me at all. Uh, the ability to offer health coverage is very often one of the first questions a small business owner is asked when, when interviewing uh, uh, new employees, do, do you offer health coverage? Um, and I'm sure lots of our participants today have had the unfortunate um, situation arise where somebody leaves and says the reason for the, their leaving is not that they don't enjoy the work or, or like what they're doing or the company that they're working for, but they really needed health coverage and they got offered a job somewhere else. Well, it's especially interesting result, Gary. I think I'm sure you remember like I do uh, back in 2009, 2010 when health reform was being debated, there was a big discussion about whether with the individual mandate and all the subsidies going to individuals to buy health insurance, would this mean the end of employer provided health coverage? Would there still be that pressure from employees to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, have employer provided coverage? Well, we have our answer, don't we? We, we do, and maybe one of our successes was the ability to convince the IRS that individual coverage HRAs could be offered by uh, small employers, where if I didn't feel I could afford health coverage for all my employees, I could fund an HRA on a, a tax-favorable basis. But as, as we talked about, interestingly, I as a small business non-C-Corp owner was not able to participate in that same program that I might offer to all my employees. Yeah. All right. Well, with that fascinating discussion, I think we're going to kick over now to Todd, unless you have more you want to speak to on that, um, to Bill Belknap. He's going to talk to us a little bit about regulatory policy, a little bit about the session, and then we have four, four topics that he's going to be able to walk through first. So, Bill, over to you. Great, thank you, ML, very much appreciated. Um, so regulatory policy is something that we had our session on last week, and uh, just an excellent discussion about uh, many issues uh, involved uh, with regulatory um, matters with the small businesses. And what is always interesting to me is that uh, uh, among the uh, various policy initiatives, uh, regulatory policy is always among uh, the top of the issues that uh, small businesses cite. Uh, that uh, hinders their business development. So uh, with our session last week, we had two excellent um, uh, policy experts that, that talked to us. One was uh, Thomas Sullivan, uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He's the VP for Small Business Policy, certainly a longtime friend um, and participant with the NSBA. And also uh, David Burton, who's for the Heritage Foundation, senior fellow in e economic policy. And of note was David's uh, quite firm uh, opinions about the uh, beneficial ownership law, which uh, we'll get into just a little bit uh, more late, later. The uh, uh, summarizing the various uh, issues with re regulatory policy. First of all, is uh, uh, regulatory reform and paperwork reduction. So I know as a small business owner myself, dealing with the federal government uh, and the enormity of the paperwork that is involved with the processing proposals, having to read solicitations, understand what they mean, what they want. Uh, it's extremely important for me to have uh, regulations and policies and procedures that are straightforward, 
easy to understand, easy to implement, so that I can focus on uh, providing the best uh, goods and services that, that I can to my customers. So with our regulatory reform and paper reduction, um, we know that uh, on average from some studies that uh, small business owners spend about 12,000 uh, bucks every year dealing with regulations. Um, the uh, small business owner tends to be the expert within their company. And our concern is, is really stifling um, innovation and small business growth with too, too much uh, regulations. Um, what some of the solutions that we have is that to require uh, agencies to consider all of the indirect costs and detailed alternatives uh, to minimize any significant adverse impact. You know, uh, as I work with lawyers uh, very infrequently, um, they charge uh, every six minutes of their time to you. And it seems like to me that could be a, uh, an example of a, of a model to follow when uh, uh, the executive branch implements regulations. Think about every second or every minute that the small business owner has to attend to your regulation and what the cost burden of that would be. So bottom line for us is uh, require regulatory flexibility analysis as a prerequisite to final rules being issued and a common sense uh, approach uh, to this uh, issue that uh, propels and doesn't stifle small businesses as small businesses truly are the growth engine of our economy. Next issue that we had was uh, strengthening the SBA Office of Advocacy. And uh, we know that it's one of the major formal ab uh, advocates for small businesses in the federal government. And we wanna make sure that the uh, Office of Advocacy uh, is fully resourced uh, and fully staffed as quickly as possible so they can be an advocate for us. Uh, I'll just give you one quick example of the success of the uh, Advocacy's Office recently in, in 2019. Um, while they're monitoring federal com agency compliance with the uh, Regulatory Flexibility Act, uh, they cited uh, uh, it resulted in changes to 10 specific rules uh, that resulted in uh, 773 million in quantifiable small business regulatory compliance cost savings in, in that year. So just one great example of why we need them fully staffed and, and fully funded. Uh, also note that uh, the uh, uh, President Biden had nominated uh, Isabel Guzman as the, to lead the SBA, and on February 3rd, she was uh, uh, confirmed in a hearing. We want the Chief Counsel for Advocacy to receive the same expediency as, as she did. Next issue that we have is uh, regulatory reform, or uh, I'm sorry, is uh, repealing the beneficial ownership law. And that's something we talked in great detail last week. And basically, the uh, uh, NDAA was passed uh, in December of 2020. The new law requires certain limited liability corporations and other companies to inform the Treasury Financial Crimes Enforcement Network of their so-called beneficial owners and establish a private, private database uh, of those names. Large companies are uh, primarily exempted from this requirement. So for small businesses, uh, we think it's just a, a terribly unfair additional burden uh, uh, to us. So we know this is a long-standing policy uh, for the NSB to try to repeal this law. Uh, short of that, uh, we're waiting for um, uh, it to be, uh, for, for uh, the opportunity for regulations to come out for us to make comments on it that minimizes uh, the impact to small businesses. I'm not going to go into uh, the uh, close of partisan divide and reform politics other than just saying that uh, we firmly believe that uh, um, disclo full disclosure of where the money is coming into uh, from various PACs is, is a must uh, for good government and that uh, any way that we can uh, promote and incentivize our government to work together as they should in an efficient manner to pass routine um, uh, funding legislation as a quick example is uh, paramount and directly affects the performance of small businesses. So with that, I'll turn it over. I believe we have a poll. So two questions to consider. Which uh, source of regulation is the most burdensome uh, to your business? And the second would be, please select the uh, top two following areas which pose the largest regulatory burden on your business. So while people are filling out those polls, Bill, one of the things that I appreciate about you taking the helm here is this area is not as straightforward 
as it at first blush might be, and that that purposeful path through regulations so that we don't have the tick, tick, tick of the clock <laughs> as you were describing, but that we also don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So you, in your role and your committee, have this very focused, you need to be surgical about what is the extraneous just burden and what is so important, not only for the country, but also specifically for small business. Appreciate you taking on that, that effort for it. It's a really important thing. The second thing, the second thing that I would say is, in a, it's the, I don't know if it's two sides of the coin or, or how it is, but it's so tightly coupled to what you're doing here. For example, with this beneficial ownership, the, the impact on small business is so draconian and so personally risky to the owner of, of the company. And yet the intent of why the legislation was put in place has such importance to our country. There's just this not under lack of understanding of how it affects small business. So right. like, no, that's, a great, that's a great, yeah, that's a great please. point. ML. And, and I, I would add that um, like a lot of things, um, there's other uh, agencies in the government that already have so much of this information Certainly the IRS uh, does, and there ought to be cross checks um, between uh, uh, you know, the Secretary of the Treasury and, and, and IRS. And, uh, and so unfortunately, sometimes those agencies act as two independent stovepipes instead of sharing, readily sharing information, which could uh, take yeah. a lot of the burden off of small businesses. And, and it's that purposeful clarity, like you just articulated there, like the, not just that this is bad for us, but we understand why you came to it, and here's a suggestion that it's just one of the things I, I love about our, our team here at the, at the NSBA, at NSBA. Oh, your poll results are up, if you want to walk through those. Sure. Well, um, which uh, source of regulation is most burdensome? Um, probably no surprise, but the federal government. Um, so certainly we'll be focusing on that uh, for the majority of this year. Uh, there are various uh, policies and procedures, that, some that I outlined already. So it's uh, interesting to note there. And the second thing is, uh, please select uh, two top following areas which pose the largest regulatory burden on your businesses and the complexity of complying with rules. You know, I, I look forward to, uh, uh, in, in the future, of uh, citing some of the best practices. And I know that uh, uh, with uh, one of my customers, the uh, Veterans uh, uh, Affairs, um, as I'm being audited as a, to be a certified veteran business owner, um, in that audit, I'm actually assigned an auditor who is readily available for your phone and email where I need to ask clarifying questions. And to me, it's been ex extremely helpful um, in uh, getting through these this as quickly as possible and uh, perhaps more importantly is giving him or her the information they need to, to, uh, to make a determination as quickly as possible. Oh my gosh, as another federal contractor, I am wicked jealous. <laughs> <laughs> that is tremendous access. That's great. Yeah, and that's those are the kind of stories we need to bring forward. Thank you. Thank you for sharing them. And thank you for your leadership on this committee. It's really very much appreciated. With that, Todd, I will turn it back to you for any general sort of policy insight or any, however you want to wrap this section up. Well, thank you very much. I think we have a few questions we should try to get to from our participants. I think that's this should be the primary focus for the next few minutes. Obviously, there's a diversity of, of priorities here, right? There are immediately pressing things or things that are new on the table because of the pandemic. There are things that have been uh, small business priorities for years. Um, and there are uh, those things that are long-term goals, but probably aren't actionable. And other things that are really on the table right now. So it really is going to be up to our members when you get your ballots to sort of weigh all those different competing factors and think about the importance of each one in, in those various contexts. So with that, uh, uh, Jody Milanese, who's our Vice President for Government Affairs, has been monitoring the Q&As that have been coming in. So I'm going to turn over to her to sort of uh, uh, ask some maybe consolidated questions that maybe are similar and then sort of, sort of get some of these things addressed before we get too much further down the road. Jody, will you ask us some questions? Great, thank you, Todd. Uh, this question would be for Marilyn. Why is the gross receipt amount being used as a determining factor for the PPP 2.0? As a small woman-owned agricultural company, our gross receipts do not paint a fair picture due to the increased cost of equipment that we have paid to make the sale of the ag equipment. I understand your question. If you are a farm-related business, you are not fi filing a Schedule C, you're filing a Schedule F, and the law allows you to use top line total sales as a multiple. So you're not restricted by line seven. If you truly are in the farming business, they recognize 
the costs you have. It's only those who are non-farm, not filing a Schedule F, who are filing a Schedule C, that cannot use their top line sales revenue as the multiple. They have to reduce their cost of sales to get down to what the general world would call as a gross profit. The IRS calls it something different, but no, most of us would call it gross profit. So as a farmer, uh, you are still going to be able to do a multiple of the top line. That was not true with the first payroll protection, but it is true now. Thank you. This question uh, would be directed towards ML. Um, have you heard of anything about standardized surveillance software for technology companies, either as an option or federally mandated? So it's interesting. There's not always the, here's what you should do. There's the, oh my God, you did this <laughs> kind of response to things. There's a section 889 of the National Defense Authorization Act last year, or a year before, but anyways, it just came into enactment, said we can't use anything in federal or defense contracts that has any components from Huawei. It turns out that most of the video cameras have those kinds of chips in them. So there's a, a line that I've heard of that is don't do this, and if you have it, you better take it out of whatever you have going on, rip it out of your warehouse, whatever it is, if you're going to continue doing federal contracting. I think it would be really useful and, and I will tell you again, this, this hearing this morning was really fascinating on emerging technology and that there was this whole concept of all businesses will be digitized, will be using more software and, and digital capabilities. So I think there's an opportunity for us to get involved and have a voice that is making sure that the recommendations and, and the regulations like the kind of work that, that Bill's doing with his committee are putting out sort of best practices and standards as well as the oh my God, can't believe you're doing that kind of thing. So, so this is just an opportunity for NSBA to get involved and I think we're sort of cresting into those conversations as we move forward. Thank you, ML. We've gotten a lot of questions about minimum wage. Uh, so Bob Shea, have you heard of a reduction of tax rate to offset the increase of the minimum wage? Uh, most minimum wage laborers are receiving subsidies, which makes their pay equal to or more than $15 an hour. Uh, I am not aware. Uh, Todd, are you, are you aware of any subsidies? Uh, not specifically. I mean, traditionally, when we go we get around to talking about minimum wage increases in the past, there have often been proposals to sort of help small businesses, some small businesses to afford it, some, some breaks here and there, sometimes it's sold into a tax package. That could be the case this time around uh, as well. Um, but I guess the, the other question is, if there are tax breaks, who are they for? Uh, the, the, for many years ago, the, the earned income tax credit was seen as an alternative to the increase in the minimum wage, so that it wasn't uh, small, struggling low-wage businesses that would face the brunt of a wage increase, but that we could, we could uh, increase people's, uh, working people's income through the EITC. Um, the EITC is as popular now as it used to be for a variety of reasons. So I, a big increase there probably is not on the table right now, but uh, it's a it's a uh, um, it's it's a good question, one we should explore. Great. Let's see what else we have coming in. Uh, questions on uh, tax issues. So uh, perhaps Malcolm, maybe Todd, and whoever else wants to weigh in. Um, beyond championing the uh, permanence of the pass-through deduction, uh, what else is NSBA prioritizing on extending deductions to all pass-through entities? Sure. And have so, you, oh, 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 I was just oh, going go to ahead, do Jody. a follow-up. Nope, yeah. just as a follow-up. And um, are we considering proposing any exemptions on uh, tax rates, effective tax rates, increasing effective tax rates for small businesses, especially pass-throughs. Sure. So, uh, as, you know, as long as I've been uh, participating with the NSBA, uh, rate parity has always been uh, a huge issue uh, for us to, uh, so that the tax burden of small businesses is on par with, with larger businesses. And we've, we've uh, fought to, for those issues for, for a long time. Uh, including with the um, with the uh, Trump administration tax plan, uh, which got us closer uh, to rate parity, uh, but obviously not all the way. Uh, with the Biden administration tax plan uh, on the table, and of course it's just a plan at this point. Nothing nothing's been implemented. Uh, there's talk about limiting uh, the Section 199A pass-through deduction. 
uh, for small businesses above a certain income threshold, uh, which obviously goes against uh, our uh, ideal of, of rate parity and, and bringing the tax burden down for, for small businesses. Uh, also, something that goes against rate parity in general is the uh, Biden administration plan wants to increase the corporate income tax rate from 21% to 28%. Uh, so for shooting for parity, uh, that that parity gap decreases, but it decreases because the corporate rate increases, not because we're bringing our small business tax rates down. So um, a lot of things to consider. I think just to rem just to remember, you know, the Biden tax plan is just a plan at this point. Uh, we probably won't see any um, hard push for for getting that plan implemented until mid this year, uh, especially with all the COVID relief legislation. Our priorities in place and with the uh, Senate uh, closely divided um, uh, between both parties you know what what is likely to get passed is still still up in the air uh, there's going to be a lot of negotiation uh, to get anything passed uh, to make uh, all sides happy and and, uh, and keep this as uh, bipartisan as possible so that's that's my take on it I don't know, Todd uh, or ML or anybody else, if you have any other, other uh, yeah. points to make. I think that's right. I, I think this, this year, a tax increase on anybody is unlikely. Uh, but as we move forward, that it becomes increasingly likely with the economy, especially if the economy is, is recovering better. Um, and we're getting closer and closer to those, those, many of those tax breaks that not going to describe for pass-throughs are all expiring. Uh, and so there's got to be some negotiated deal uh, on how to deal with those. And that could wind up with some tax increases for some people and not for others. Uh, but we'll be in the midst of that fight for uh, the small business community for sure. Uh, Judy, I think we have time for one more. What's a really good question? Okay, I'm trying to find one. We have a lot coming in, um, and, I, and I understand that, folks, and I'm sorry we can't get to everyone, um, but we are taking notes, and, and we'll try and follow up with the speakers who you've addressed some questions to. Okay, let's find a good last one. <laughs> um, is, let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to find one last one here. Maybe that would be broad enough for everybody. Uh, that would be maybe interested. I know we have a lot of government contractors here. So um, wondering if you've heard of any chance that the government will offer grants or relax the $14.5 million requirement business must have in order to be granted certain contracts with the federal government, especially for minority owned businesses. This is Marilyn. Um, everything that been, I've seen coming out and subcontractors has been ways to try to make it simpler or easier. I haven't seen anything from a grant perspective or a release. Unfortunately, as ML could probably speak to better than I, the more regulations that are coming out are making it more difficult for them to comply, particularly with cybersecurity and other things, but I have not seen anything yet as far as a financial grant program. Yeah, we, we may see some grant programs for some specific kind of businesses, but not tied to government contracting per se. I mean, there are, there's talk of uh, grant programs, of course, for for, for uh, shuttered venues, maybe for some restaurants and an upcoming bill potentially, uh, but not government contracting per se. Uh, and, I, and I don't know that the, the specific provision of the fourteen and a half million dollars is referenced in this question, but but one of the concerns that we have about the broad spectrum of of uh, of government contracting is is there not to be sort of artificial barriers that sort of wind up restricting contracts to only larger companies, right? There, there are many ways that they can say, we only want a bigger company doing this work without specifically saying, we only want a bigger company doing this work. And, and those need to be uh, addressed and, uh, and, uh, and kicked out if we can. And Todd, I think this is an industry that may get more attention as we go forward. As we talked about, as they get squeezed out of more traditional lending markets and there's more pressure and they're talking to their program officers and they're talking to the various agencies that they do work for, there will be some need, particularly those services that are critical to be provided. Yep. It's one area that may emerge. Well, I want to thank everybody for, for your, your work, for, you know, uh, uh, Gary and Marilyn and Marilyn, who couldn't join us today, and uh, and Malcolm and 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 Bill and Bob, you've done a, just a tremendous job with uh, both with this program, uh, but also with the committees that you run. And I know it's it's a great deal of work to sort of 
stay on top of all these issues on behalf of the small business community, gather input, work with the staff, uh, and we just thank you for all your year and work. We really do appreciate it. So, Annelle, back to you. Yeah, I just, oh, am I muted? No, there we go. Um, yeah, I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate and, and I'm aware of how much time and effort everybody puts in at this volunteer position that they do because the issues are so important. And it's just, it's, it's really an honor to work with all of you. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we work together and what our process is for developing policy. The small business that we're doing. Oops. Somebody needs to go on mute. <laughs> Um, the joys, the joys of a digital experience. <laughs> um, Small Business Congress is a key piece of our policy process, but it's only a piece. The Small Business Congress, as we talked about before, establishes broad priorities and these act as our guiding star, but issues come up and NSBA is nimble and, and really nimble and really responsive and able to react through our policy structure to new issues as they arise, even issues as big as a pandemic. Last year was spectacular across the board watching people come together constructively and collaboratively. So the policy structure at NSBA, we have an issue committee where any NSBA member can serve on our issue committees, which meet quarterly. This is where policy ideas are generated, discussed, and explained. I will tell you that often the staff will find a really fascinating speaker to come and talk to us at these committee meetings and just, I mean, no one that you'd normally have access to, but just really insightful and thoughtful folks. Um, there's also a policy group. These are groups of board appointed NSBA members who meet monthly and take the discussions from these broader issue committee discussions, debate, and ultimately make recommendations to leadership if we will work on the issue. And then the Legislative Action Council. This is an oversight committee with the chairs of all of our policy and issue groups who meet monthly to discuss recommendations from each committee and determine NSBA's marching orders, our advocacy positions, and path forward. If an issue is particularly important or controversial, con controversial, controversial, <laughs> the LAC will forward the issue to NSBA's 32 member board of trustees who have the final say and we meet quarterly. The Leadership Council, have you seen, as you've seen, also plays a critical role in populating our issue committees, as well as providing an active grassroots group of advocates that regularly engage with lawmakers, regulators, and the media. And I want to encourage you and build upon this concept of the issue briefs that you see in your packet here, the ones that we prioritize, the ability to go and meet with your local member of Congress and offer not only your experience so that they understand on a more visceral level small business impacts and opportunities, but also that you are a, a like I said before, a point in a network a network that you can flex and get them the experts or people that have specific experience with whatever issue may come up for them. I want to have you all keep this sort of phrase in mind. In terms of being effective advocates for small business, we need to be a friend before we need a friend. We need to offer our experience and our knowledge and our network before we need to ask them to support us. So be a friend before you need a friend. And finally, as you've likely heard, bipartisanship. It's critical here at NSBA. We are a trusted voice. There is a comfort level that when we come in, there's not a vitriolic them and us. There is a small business. Here's our experience. Here's the challenge and here's the opportunity we think we can offer you to, to either do it this way or, or craft a way to do it better. But it's not just here. I, I really like you to hear now from the House Small Business, small business Committee Chair Velasquez and Ranking Member Luke Meyer on how bipartisanship works in their committee. They, they've been really great supporters of us, and they've sent a, a video along to to support this sort of non-partisan issue-based advocacy that we're talking about. So Molly, over to you if you want to run the video. There are also plenty of areas where I think we can find a bipartisan consensus that benefits small firms. Over the next few years, I think there will be opportunities for Congress to increase federal contracting opportunities for small businesses, help rural economies through entrepreneurship, and improve critical SBA programs. Well, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think the PPP is a, a program is a place where we can find some common ground. I think. Uh, 
the last COVID uh, bill, there's some other programs and funded programs there that help uh, small businesses in different ways. Uh, those seems to be able to, uh, I think, uh, be areas where we can find some common ground. Um, you know, rules and regulations where they make sense uh, are places we can go. I'm very concerned about the direction of most rules and regulations from the administration. So um, I'm not sure we can find a lot of common ground there, but there may be some. And we definitely want to encourage them to find common ground. It's in everyone's best interest. So now, before we go off to vote on the priority issues, I think some additional background and insight from friends on Capitol Hill would be very helpful. So another quick message from the House Small Business Committee. The Small Business Committee will pursue legislation and priorities that facilitate an equitable recovery from the COVID crisis for small businesses. The pandemic has shuttered hundreds of thousands of small firms and left many small business workers without a job. In 2020, Congress instituted programs like the PPP and COVID-19 IRL program that are helping many small businesses keep their operation running. But COVID is still rampant and entrepreneurs need more help. That is why President Biden has proposed the American Rescue Plan, his aid package that includes billions in new funding to carry small businesses to the other side of the crisis. I'm working with the Biden administration to ensure that small businesses get the aid they need to survive. At the same time, we must look to the future and ensure that small businesses can succeed in the long run. The next aid package must include post-recession stimulus measures to spark long-term growth. Small firms need a bill that will help support the small business economy and fund public health initiatives to crush this virus. Anything less will be selling our entrepreneurs short. Yeah, I think, you know, we need to finish up and continue to watch uh, the PPP program as it goes. Do we need to tweak it? Do we need to add some more money to it? Do we need to make it more targeted? I mean, those are all things we need to, uh, to watch for as well as provide the oversight to make sure the money is going where it needs to go and, and the rules are being adhered to. Uh, from that standpoint, when you talk about oversight, I think rules and regulations are going to play an integral part in the next uh, two to four years of this administration with regards to how they want to uh, oversee our country and our economy. And if it's anything like the Obama years, where they pumped out all sorts of rules and regulations that some of them were not in the best interest of our, especially small businesses, uh, we need to be watchful for that. Uh, the template is there for how we can grow this economy. The, la the first three years of the Trump administration with lower taxes, less regulation, we saw our economy blossom and bloom after the, pre the last three years of the Obama administration, where we saw it stagnating and actually go backwards for the last three years. So. I'm very concerned um, and I'm watching very carefully. The administration has already issued an executive order that would take off the books. The executive order that President Trump had that for every one, for one rule they put on, he'd take two rules off the books. And he wound up almost uh, eight to 10, according to some of the uh, Washington uh, news folks here. So he was very successful in doing that. And by relieving those regulations, we empowered the entrepreneurs, the small business people in this country to drive this economy. And we saw what great things it did. So I'm very concerned by rescinding that executive order that we could be going in the wrong direction. So we'll be very watchful of that. Another bill I'm gonna uh, have been offering uh, and, and working with, uh, with our COVID uh, ex expansion bills here uh, is a forbearance bill. One that allows the regulators <clears throat> to give forbearance to the banks and credit unions to be able to then give uh, forbearance to their customers. We don't need a repeat of 08 and 09 when we saw the regulators come in and force the banks and credit unions to foreclose on all our customers and in fact get rid of entire uh, industries and businesses in, in these communities and decimate them, not only from the standpoint of losing those businesses, but the jobs that go with it. So I think um, we're going to continue to work to, 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 there's a couple of issues in these bills, uh, trouble debt restructuring rule and the CISO rule that we're going to continue to uh, extend and make sure that uh, the regulators continue to give uh, time and forbearance. So that's just some of the things that we're going to be watching for, but obviously there's a lot more, but I think those are the highlights that you need to think about that we're going to be watching for you.
a helpful look for folks at what the latest leaders of the House Small Business Committee on the Democratic and Republican side uh, see coming up this year, the things they currently are planning to work on. Obviously, we can influence them uh, as collectively in some of their views. Um, but uh, in general, the small, House Small Business Committee is, has been a terrific forum for the small business community because while they don't have a big jurisdiction on issues outside of the Small Business Administration, uh, they have a wide jurisdiction on issues they highlight. They hold hearings and, and uh, really call attention to a wide range of small business issues and have really been able to help us sort of drive some of those forward. So I think that partnership will continue. Um, also, I, I thought it'd be useful to hear from some of the other groups that we are a part of. The, a, a few years ago, the NSBA uh, was key to f uh, founding the Small Business Roundtable. You heard briefly from John Stanford, who's the co-executive director of the Small Business Roundtable at the beginning of the session. Uh, I also asked John to talk a little bit about what the Small Business Roundtable thinks it will focus on uh, in 2021. So uh, let's hear from John briefly, and then we'll come back and, and, and talk about that. We're going to be working hard to rethink small business administration lending programs, whether it's the 7A, 504, or microloan programs. We'll be working to modernize them for the 21st century. Many of these programs haven't been updated in quite some time, and so we'll be wait, looking for ways to streamline them, make them less burdensome on small business owners, and make sure that they are an easy way for small businesses to access capital. We'll be exploring how small businesses can access two markets that are so critical to their growth. The federal market, by ensuring contracting uh, opportunities are there for small businesses. We know that the federal government and state and local governments can be so critical to the growth of a small business. That first contract, that first client, that first opportunity can often come from a government entity. And so we'll be working with them to ensure that there's fair opportunities for small businesses. We'll also be looking to international markets. 95% of the world's population and two thirds of its purchasing power are outside our borders. So we're gonna be working with the Biden administration and the United States Congress on ways to ensure that our trade relations are opening doors for small businesses all around the world. We're also gonna be trying to address some of the workforce challenges that we hear from small businesses all the time. Going into 2020, we, that was the number one issue for so many small businesses that we heard from around the country, was that they simply couldn't find or retain skilled workers for them to grow. That's missed potential. And as we normalize and return back to where we were in early 2020, we're gonna have to address that longstanding issue of making sure that small businesses have access to a suitable workforce. There's gonna be a lot of talk in this Congress about technology, technology companies, technology platforms. But I think we have to remember there are so many facets of the way technology has entered our lives, from what we're experiencing now at a virtual event to platforms online that have enabled people to sell. That there'll also be challenges about those who aren't feeling the benefits of technology whether that's because high-speed internet and broadband have not reached their communities, or if, as in any major transition, in any major industrial revolution like technology is putting us through now, those benefits need to be equitable and they need to be inclusive. And I think that's something that we'll be focusing on as well. Well, I want to thank John and the whole team at SBR. SBR. Uh, it's been a really good partnership. Uh, NSBA helped, again, found the Small Business Roundtable, and it's really, really essentially a coalition of, of leading national small business associations. So in addition to SBA, it's got groups like the National Association of Women Business Owners, the uh, U.S. Black Chambers of Commerce, uh, U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and, and several others. And we, we work together really care closely, and, and this has provided a great forum for us to all represent you and the small business community even better. Better. Um, next, I'd like to turn things over to Brian Morales. Uh, Brian is the president and CEO of ProCal Lighting, and he's also, uh, for this, these purposes, our vice chair for communications on the NSBA Board of Trustees. 
Brian uh, started off as a member for leadership council and is now in a, his first term on the NSBA board. And he's been tremendously active in both groups and a great resource uh, for us here uh, at staff level and at the board level. So Brian's going to uh, take a minute and share his insight on how you can be more involved, engaged here, uh, and also highlight some of the resources that we have uh, for our members. Yeah, thank you, Todd. The NSBA prides itself on being the voice of small business in DC, and we're able to perform service through keeping in constant contact with small businesses across the nation. Uh, we know you're busy running a company and perhaps your business is not in DC. So the NSBA, NSBA acts as an extension to you and your interest on the Hill. Our legislators need to hear from small businesses more often. And one of these methods of connection is through our surveys. Uh, participating in the NSBA survey is a pivotal tool that allows us to create a broader narrative of what small businesses are experiencing across the nation. That data is what our legislators need and use as evidence regarding the creation of new laws or amending existing ones. Not only that, this survey data is valuable to news agencies who communicate the statistical data in their reporting, expressing the real hurt of small business encounter in any given time. The media also shares individual stories of real small businesses. Uh, they utilize the NSBA to source these businesses. Perhaps you received an email from Molly asking for participants who have experienced a particular issue or can simply share their experience with current news events. Your willingness to participate by responding with a brief summary is why NSBA has relations with the largest news networks and publications. If you're unsure if your story is newsworthy, share anyways and let the author or the producer determine if it's the right fit. I myself has participated in this and have had my company and my message communicated on national levels through publications. We also produce our own newsletter called The Weekly Advocate, and NSBA would love to share your story. You can fill out our member spotlight form if you'd like to participate. The link to this is at the end of your packet. Uh, we also provide other resources through our website. As I mentioned, the NSBA is a voice of small business, but nothing speaks more loudly than a letter to your own representatives. This could not be made simpler. On the NSBA website, you can find all the issue briefs for current topics being debated in committee or even docketed for a floor vote. These issue letters can be sent as a personal letter from you to your representatives, even if you don't know who those people are. When you fill in your name and your address, the system identifies your representatives and sends the appropriate emails to those offices. The power of a letter from someone who will be voting for or against an elected official is a powerful thing. I've done this on numerous times, and I'm happy to report that I now receive personal calls from my own congressman on my own experience, the latest one being on how PPP is affecting my business and whether the hurdles or uh, where, whether it's working. It's a great way to create a relationship uh, with your representatives. Uh, at this time, I'd like to share a quick message from the House and Small Business Committee on why this is all important. I think the best thing small business owners can do to ensure their voice is heard is to stay engaged and be vocal. There are so many different issues out there that impact entrepreneurs and they are not confined to the Small Business Committee's jurisdiction. That is why small business owners need to provide lawmakers with their perspective on the issues that impact them. Input direct from actual small business owners is the best way to ensure that lawmakers take your interests into account. So I encourage all small business owners to stay on top of the issues, write your members of Congress, and get involved with advocacy groups like the National Small Business Association that are working to promote your interests. These are some of the best ways to make sure that your voice is heard loud and clear. Well, I think uh, an association like, association like this and any association that promotes your interests is the way to go. Uh, but it's, it's a layering approach. In other words, uh, you need to have the association lead the charge, help organize, help uh, put together your, 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 your wish list or your problems with solutions, and then have you as part of this uh, overall picture of how you can communicate with us to come in and talk to us on an individual basis 
uh, as someone who represents uh, individuals, individual businesses, I want to know from you personally. Give me a call, give my office a call, to let us know how these rules and regulations are affecting you. Uh, I want to know your, your circumstance, how it, how's it affecting your customers, how's it affecting your community. And I think those are things that are important for you to be able to participate. Uh, your association can do a lot, but uh, they sort of lay the groundwork and you come in, I think, on top of that and personalize it. It's very, very important that you participate and that's how you can be, be best at it. All right. Well, that's I think it's a really important message for our members of Congress who uh, who they're the ones who receive these messages from back home and they know what works. Um, so what's next? Uh, well, uh, thank you all for hanging in there with us and talking through these issues and hearing from lots of different uh, perspectives on, on lots of different things. In the next 30 minutes, you will each be receiving a ballot via email from an SBA uh, linked to our priorities. Um, so if you don't receive it, check your spam first. And if you st and it's still out there, email us at press, P-R-E-S-S, -S, at nsba.biz and we'll, and we'll take care of it. Now you have to vote by today because we want to release these results uh, publicly uh, as soon as we can. So um, votes need to come in by 8 p.m. Eastern time today. And if they come in later, we won't be able to count them because we will release the results. Now, when you vote, uh, input your name and other identifying information so we know uh, the people who are voting are the people who should vote, um, but we won't be connecting your, uh, your individual identity and the, and the votes that you cast. Uh, finally, we're going to ask you to select 10 priorities, uh, and we're going to ask you to select them in order uh, and to vote for all 10. You, you, you can't uh, cast your final vote until you've chosen all 10 priorities in their order of priority for you and the order that you think they should be in for NSBA. Um, so we'll be releasing those results uh, this week. So stay tuned to nsba.biz uh, about that. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to give this uh, your you know thoughtful consideration for what not only is important to your business, but what you think should be the, uh, the, the, the charge and the priority for the small business community overall. Uh, before I turn things back to ML, I also want to just sort of thank uh, Ring Central, who has helped sponsor this for us uh, and, and brought us the platform that we've been able to use today. Um, and uh, I also want to point out that they're going to be holding a, a, a webinar on March 3rd that will help us all sort of dig deeper into remote work issues, how to use these platforms, and all the rest. So uh, I would encourage you all to, to participate in that free webinar. Uh, visit ringcentral.com backslash SBC to learn more and register for that. Uh, I think it'll be, a, you'll see some familiar NSBA faces there, and I think it'll be a, an important and interesting uh, uh, experience. So ML, uh, final thoughts on, uh, on uh, this year's Small Business Congress. Final thoughts. It's so like, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Some some thoughts, whether they're final or not. <laughs> some thoughts are, this has been spectacular and a really interesting engagement. And I cannot wait to do this all in person with all of you the next time we do it. A yeah. couple of thoughts when I when I was going through what, what we talked about today and what happened, there's been this focus on bipartisan. I want to remind us all why that's important. We are an organization that advocates for the best interests of small business. We don't want to get caught up in that. So a couple of practical recommendations. One of the things we talked about on the board is to be purposeful in your voice, your language. There's no us or them. There's only we. We are small business. From a small business perspective, how do we engage with you on this topic? Hold your colleagues and your members of Congress accountable to this as well. It's a discipline we need to bring back into our dialogue. What is the ask them what is the issue and establish that common ground and then ask them how are they working with their colleagues to address this issue colleagues on both sides of the aisle and then ask them how can we help you to do that how can we help you reach across the aisle these are the kinds of supportive constructive engagement that we can do as small business that drives to an issue versus a partisan divide divide and then i want to encourage you to celebrate them when they do that as the House Small Business Committee Chair just told us now, stay engaged and remain vocal. And as the Ranking Chair said, tell me your stories, personalize it. These are the things that I'd like all of us to take away from the experience over the last couple of weeks and the, and the event today. So maybe I do have some final thoughts. There you go. <laughs> and I'd also really like to thank all of you for joining us. 
offering your time, offering your thoughtfulness, and please let us know what you think with your votes so we know how to collectively act in all of our best interests. Thank you again for joining us today.